Morning and evening devotions. <coughs> Actually, Spurgeon. I only read the morning devotions. <laughs> the evening ones always sound like such a, a prayer that, of course, sometimes the morning ones do too, but for me, the evening ones are just right, or the morning ones are just right, so I stick with them. You know, it's interesting is that people like to get into this idea that oh I don't know I, I remember a long time ago <laughs> there was a comedian named Flip Wilson and uh, he used to appear on a show called Laugh-In and other things but he used to say here come to judge here come to judge here come to judge and he also did some sets and some you know humorous routines about the devil made me do it you know and talking about Satan and all these other things. And, you know, people get the mistaken idea that because Satan is a fallen angel and that he's the god of this world, that somehow he is God. And I don't understand how they mistake that or how they get carried away to put so many attributes or abilities to a fallen angel that the scriptures do not say he has. The reality is, is that he is a fallen angel, and that's it, bottom line. And that though he was a covering angel at one time, it's still just an angel. And while angels have more ability in some ways than humanity, we have the Holy Spirit, who is God. You know, and I don't need to fear what Satan may do. The only thing he can do is to, to rob, to steal, and, you know, to deceive you know and most often he doesn't have to do a thing because in my personal opinion his his angels or his fallen angels the demons they don't come and possess you and do all kinds of manner of things to you they deceive you into going in a direction that you choose to participate with them in and that you head towards that and then you get involved in it it's kind of like telling me that you know you got muddy because you dove into a mud pile you know and once you got into the mud pile, and you were splashing around, and you got all dirty, and then you said, oh, you know, the devil may pushed me into the pile. No, you chose to go into it. You know, you chose to get into it. And that's what Satan does, is that he leads you by your own flesh into something. He doesn't have a power over you. He doesn't control you. He doesn't have that ability. It's not like the movies. It's very simple. Just resist. Simple. You know, resist the devil, he'll flee. He doesn't have time to mess with you. He's got other things to do. But he does plant things, just like seeds of faith are planted by reading the Word. He can throw things at you from the system that he set up in the world. For instance, like television or provocation through the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, or pride of life. Of course, those things can be induced or have been started by, you know, say, a satanic power or principality to cause something around you to influence you in a direction and then you could give credit i guess to satan and say well he did it well but what did you do <laughs> the reality is you did it you had the choice i mean let's get real you know come on now you can't keep saying and you know blaming and then attacking you know one angel and think that you're going to make some great leeway and headway when god said he will judge he will deliver he will be our guide. He will be our strong tower. He will be our shadow. He will, literally, he said he will, not we will. So whenever people get carried away on this, they got to do something, you know. I just am amazed, you know. And then if you're into some debate where somebody seems to be, I don't know, influenced by something that seems to be beyond what you could see, if I could give you a word, focus in on Jesus. Turn all that you know and all that you focus in on the person of Jesus. Bring every scripture, bring every argument, every debate, every concept, every idea, everything back to Jesus. Focus in on what the focus is and you'll never get deceived. But if you focus on what someone is trying to change your focus about, then you're going to be deceived because you're no longer focused on Jesus and you're no longer focused in the Word of God. When you are there and you have your eyes set upon him, you can't be deceived. Nothing will come between you and God. I just recently had a conversation where a person was all into mystical angels and 
misquoting and misdirecting and misstating and all kinds of things. And if I would have responded to each one of the misquotes, misstates, and everything else, never would have gotten anywhere. But as I kept focusing in on Jesus and presenting the Word of God through Romans, through, it was fascinating, but it went through Romans, went through Genesis, went through Isaiah, went through Habakkuk, went through Hebrews, and as just simply sharing the Word of God as it is, worded in my words, then anyone that was reading, and as people were reading, they responded by saying they liked it, they were amazed by it, and that they were witness to. And you have to recognize that sometimes direct attacks by something at you isn't for you to respond to the attacker, but it's to witness to all those that are around watching what you will do. You are a witness, not necessarily to the action that's right in front of you, but to the outward ramifications of how you react to everyone around you, because they'll be watching to see what you will do. Kind of like that song, everybody's watching to see what you will do. Well, the angels are. They sit in heaven, pondering the ways of man. So too, it may be your neighbors, it may be your friends, it may be your wife. In Spurgeon, God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry? <laughs> Anger is not always or necessarily sinful, but it has such a tendency to run wild that whenever it displays itself, we should be quick to question its character with this inquiry. Dost thou well to be angry? It may be that we can answer yes. Very frequently, anger is the madman's firebrand, but sometimes it is Elijah's fire from heaven. We do well when we are angry with sin because of the wrong which it commits against our own good and gracious God, the sin, not the sinner, or with ourselves because we remain so foolish after so much divine instruction, ourselves not the outward cause of it, or with others when the sole cause of anger is the evil which they do, the evil of their actions, not the person themselves. He who is not angry at transgression becomes a partaker in it. Sin is a loathsome and hateful thing, and no renewed heart can patiently endure it. God himself is angry with the wicked every day, and it is written in his word, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Hate the evil, not the person. <laughs> I have to keep saying that. Far more frequently it is to be feared than our anger is not commendable or even justifiable, and then we must answer, No, we don't do well because we were angry. Why should we be fretful when children, passionate with servants, and wrathful with companions? Is such anger honorable to our Christian profession or glorifying to God? Is it not the old evil heart seeking to gain dominion and exercise its authority over someone? And should we not resist it with all the might of our newborn nature? Many professors give way to temper as though it were useless to attempt resistance. But let the believer remember that he must be a conqueror in every point or else he cannot be crowned. If we cannot control our tempers, what has grace done for us? Someone told Mr. J that grace was often grafted on a crab stump. <laughs> yes, said he, but the fruit will not be crabs. We must not make natural infirmity an excuse for sin, but we must fly to the cross and pray the Lord to crucify our tempers and renew us in gentleness and meekness after his own image. People like to try to tell me that, you know, Jesus wasn't a wimp and that he was, you know, furious and somehow out of control when he whipped through the temple and was overturning tables and causing a riot. And if they understood that this was a prophecy that was given that the zeal of thine house would, you know, consume them, that they would look back and see when that had been done before and how it was done when Jewish prophets came into the temple and demonstrated what God would have them to do. They did not act in anger. They act with the zeal of God, which is a difference. There is a force to be reckoned with when a man is passionate about what he feels as opposed to being angry with what he's doing. When you have passion, and I've been accused of being a passionate person, you attract people to you because they're observing that they're, they're drawn for some reason. I don't even know why they're drawn, but they're drawn for some reason. Many cultures are passionate. You know, Italians, they say, are passionate. Jews, well, we do, you know, Jewish people are passionate. You know, eh, yeah, we're passionate about whatever, you know. <laughs> My mother used to say, I'm whole hog or nothing. And that, for me, just simply meant I was passionate about whatever it was that I was doing at the time that I was doing it. 
And so there's a difference between passion and anger. Now, if I'm angry, there's a whole different venue that I can feel that anger and I've learned to control it by using it in some ways to motivate me in a different direction. But anger can be wrathful. And so Jesus said, let not your wrath, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So be angry, but sin not. Be careful when you become angry, because it is too easy to turn it into wrath, which is stored up by God for himself, not for us to exercise on other people. Just, if you can, when you get angry, get over it, <laughs> quickly. You may find it may be deceptive.